Uh, hello, Holly. Quite a lot of things I want to talk about. Here's my list. I'd like to follow up where we got to after our discussion that we had last time about what are the right elements of a, uh, a response that brings together communities and ensures good quality uh, public health services. And I wanted to share with you where we are on that. I wanted to focus a little bit on the news about a vaccine that's come from uh, Pfizer and uh, together with a, uh, another uh, company that they work with, whose name I've forgotten. And uh, I'd like to talk to you a bit about that and about where that is all going. I'd like to talk about the association between this virus and mink. Uh, and uh, some of you will be conscious that we've had a, a bit of a, 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 a thing about the mink um, in Denmark, and I thought we could talk about that. And then I thought we should also spend a moment just talking about what's happening in the World Health Assembly, which is going on this week in the World Health Organization. And then, as always, I want to look ahead six months. Uh, and that, so those are the things I want to touch on. Um, uh, when it, uh, I've got a couple of words I want to say about treatments again. And, uh, and give a, a little bit of view on that. And so there you go, those are the things that I've got in my, in my, my list. And, um, but before I get into these, could I go to Twee and invite her to talk about what's on the LinkedIn group and also to just um, start us with our survey and anything else Twee that you want to raise, you have the floor now. Thank you, David, and welcome to everyone. As usual, we'd like to find out who's joining us today. So I will be launching that poll. For those of you not familiar, we have the window should have popped up on your screen. The first question, please share where you're joining from. Once you've done that, scroll down to your age range. And lastly, please do share how you're feeling today. You can answer more than once here. Uh, we like to see how the mood is in the room despite being a virtual meeting. I'm gonna keep that open and we'll come back to the poll results later in the session. And then while I'm here, just to let you know that beyond these uh, open online briefings, we do have a private LinkedIn community chat. So if you'd like to join that group, um, I will put a link in the chat and you can connect with me there and I'll invite you to that group. Um, it's as active as all its members. And so I just want to thank you in the meantime, uh, Rhiannon, she's not online today, but Rhiannon has shared an open document for us to contribute to. Uh, and thank you, Rebecca, we've seen your comments there. That's all for now. Thank you and back to you, David. Brilliant, Twee, lovely, very much indeed. Uh, 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 good stuff to hear from you. Really excited about the energy in the LinkedIn group. Uh, it's coming along very nicely. And um, uh, we've already got comments coming in in the chat. Here's the style that we use for those of you who've not joined us uh, very often. Uh, the system is like this. Uh, I give a sort of update lasting 20 minutes. I've given you uh, my uh, list of things I want to cover in the update. Uh, then uh, we go from that update into discussion. And for the discussion, I'm very keen to hear from all of you. And so if you could put messages in the chat function, that's just great. Alternatively, send a, 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 an email or a text to twee at forestd.info. And what happens is we've got twee uh, and others looking at the chat, and then they send messages through to Catherine, who's sitting next to me, and then Catherine passed me little prompt cards. Uh, those of you who know Catherine will know that she's really good at um, uh, tuning into what you're up to. So um, she's really uh, our excellent colleague on these sorts of things. And then here to help us in interpreting and offering suggestions are uh, John Atkinson, who's lit up and uh, they're um, part of our team waving to you. Also, uh, William Nabarro will be uh, participating. He's there in the middle. And um, uh, there are others from our team who are on. Uh, Florence is on. 
uh, though she's got a big F on her computer. And so between us, we will be looking at uh, things and managing the discussions so that they are as straightforward as we can make them. Um, what I'm therefore going to do is now go through the various different things and give them uh, in as precise a way as possible. Um, let's just start for a little bit thinking about uh, general coverage of the situation with COVID-19 around the world and what are people thinking about. Well, uh, I looked at the epidemic curve this morning and there's no doubt that we are continuing to see an increasing number of coronavirus cases reported to the world. And it's not slowing down in any way at all. And so that means that uh, it's, you know, we absolutely cannot start saying to ourselves or to each other that this situation is moving into uh, an, any kind of stability. And uh, why am I saying that? Because I just don't want anybody thinking that the problem, as we like to put it, is in any way uh, calming down. The situation is still very intense around the world. And um, not only that, uh, although we perhaps have not got the intensity of deaths that we saw some months ago, we are certainly still seeing between five and six, uh, sorry, between five and 10,000 people dying each day as a result of COVID. In the last 24 hours, there were 678,000 new cases of COVID reported. Just think of that. That's in one day, uh, nearly, uh, well, over two thirds of a million just in one day. And this is a huge number when we consider how much lower the numbers of cases were at the beginning of the year in April. And uh, there were 8,311 people died as a result of COVID in the last 24 hours. Overall, 1.25 million people have died as a result of COVID. I just have to keep reminding myself as each day goes by of just how enormous this is. And during the last month, the death rates have been going up. A month ago, it was 5,000 people dying each day of COVID. Now it's 8,300. Okay, it's not as fast as it has been at other times in the pandemic, but this is still rising. And, and just to go through again where the situ situation is particularly troublesome, it is in the European region. Really, in Europe during the last month, the, the, the deaths per day have increased from uh, really a few hundred to 4,000. That's within the space of about a month. I mean, it really is a very rapid increase in deaths in this place. And, and one of the places that's got the most COVID in terms of numbers who are infected per 100,000 and busy hospitals is, guess where? Geneva, Switzerland. It was in the newspapers today saying, why is Geneva apparently the worst place in Europe. I don't know whether it's true. I haven't studied the, the printout, but gosh, the situation here is troublesome. And the situation with people trying to get hospital admission is very difficult. In the Americas, the, the disease is still spreading. And in the USA in particular, there are parts of the US with very high levels of disease and high levels of hospitalization. The other region in the WHO family it's really picked up is what's called the Eastern Mediterranean region. That's really the Middle East. Uh, there, the numbers of deaths reported per day are in the region of 500. So that's much lower than in Europe, but it's increasing super rapidly. Whereas Africa is still much lower, though 
I must say, I'm quite concerned about the reports I'm seeing uh, from parts of Africa, particularly Kenya, and be very good to hear from colleagues in Kenya, whether they are sensing that the virus is really moving around quite rapidly around them. So just to, to, to continue to say, this is still incredibly serious. This is still a, a killing far too many people. This is still uh, affecting many who recover, who've got long-term illness. Uh, and this is still upsetting food systems, upsetting employment, increasing poverty, and having a, a terribly bad impact on people who are already poor. The poor are getting poorer as a result of this disease. Very pleased to read that uh, uh, President-elect, if that's a correct term, Joe Biden, uh, has uh, appointed one of his first acts, his coronavirus task force, and he's named the three leaders. Uh, these are all people uh, who've got very strong reputations. And um, it's great that, that the US is taking it seriously because the, the US numbers and the US situation is really very bad indeed. Uh, I'm just looking at the yesterday's case numbers in the United States, 259,000 new cases, 2,300 approximately new deaths. It's a really terrible situation and one that no, no, nobody should have allowed to happen, uh, just as we shouldn't be seeing this level of suffering and death in Europe, so we shouldn't be seeing it in the United States. Um, so that's my quick resume on where we are globally. Uh, if any of you would like to access the, um, the WHO situation report, just let me know. Uh, I can uh, ask Twee to put it in the LinkedIn group if she would find it helpful to do so. Uh, I, I'm very keen that people should be able to access this information very, very easily. So John and I, working with the rest of our team, wrote a piece that was titled Avoiding Repeated Lockdowns, which drew on your advice. Uh, we said uh, that the virus is surging back and threatening to overrun hospitals, causing long-term illness and resulting in more deaths, that it'll be with us for the foreseeable future, and that it has to be contained. Now, some colleagues said, hang on, David, you shouldn't be writing the virus is surging back, you should talk about the disease. People still, by and large, don't understand what you mean when you talk about a virus. Well, that was interesting to me because uh, we had actually been saying that we should focus on the virus. The virus is the problem that we face. And so that's why we've done it. But I'd be super interested to know whether any of you uh, want to say, um, want to say that this is uh, more about the disease. We've identified seven elements that we think need to be got right. And uh, I just will remind you what they are. They were what we talked about last time. The first is involving people everywhere, stressing that people are the solution, uh, not the problem, and engaging them in all the precautions that we've said are necessary. The doing it all that Tedros asks everybody to do, everything from physical distancing and mask wearing, to hygiene and self-isolation well sick, when sick, and paying special attention to people who, because of their occupation, their age, their vulnerabilities, uh, where they have to live, are at high risk. And very much trying to stress that these are poorer people, uh, poorer people who are really in trouble. So involving people and making sure that people are at the center. Then we said, secondly, gain trust through honesty, authenticity, and consistency. It's not just communicating be beautifully. It's actually being authentic. It's actually really being honest and it's not chopping and changing all the time. This communication part is hugely important. One thing we wrote in there that John was very keen on, don't apologize. If something's got to be done, just do it. You know, uh, we've got to get on and get on top of this virus. Thirdly, ensuring that communities are supported through nationwide webs. I saw that 
somebody on the call today had put a, a comment in LinkedIn using my term, term honeycomb to refer to the fact that things have spread widely. If we want to use the term honeycomb, if it makes more sense to describe that really unstructured web between people in our communities, then let's use it. Somebody said to me, you talk about the web, you had to better explain what web it is. I said, no, I don't want to. I want to keep it so that people don't actually have to define it. It's just creating connections and letting those connections be strong so that there is actually somebody that each one of us can call on if we feel sick, somebody that each one of us can go to help for. The fourth thing was obviously the public health part. Hank has been saying this very strongly. Now, if we can't get the public health strong, then it's no good. Or NK Seti has said, we've got to get proper public health at local level to interrupt transmission. And we've tried these various terms that we need experts in investigating up outbreaks. We need experts in contact tracing. We need experts in interrupting chains of transmission. We may need experts in busting the clusters. We just got to get these words right because they do call for a particular kind of expertise. And one of the things is people have got to isolate. If they don't isolate, it's not very worth it. And uh, in many countries represented on this call, we have non-isolation going on. Um, the fifth thing we said is that if you've got an outbreak that's developing, sometimes they're quite ferocious and you need to have integrated incident response teams at local level to deal with it, building on the original idea that we've always talked about in emergencies of having incident managers, individuals. But what we're saying is the integrated team is the key that brings together all the different actors. Many of you have encouraged us on that. Then we've said sixth, ensure that the resources and powers of national government are used where they are most val valuable. Uh, this is really trying to stress that the role of national government in this is to support the local authorities. And then we come to the seventh, which is connecting all the elements and ensuring that the system works. Well, we wrote that uh, in return uh, to, in response to a commission, and we thought, teehee, it will get published, but it didn't, because as many of you know, there was a very important thing that happened on Saturday in the world that actually meant that the uh, space in the newspaper for our little article was removed but I, I got some really good advice today on where to send it and we will try to put it up over the next uh, couple or three days but the fact that it's held back just gives me a chance to share it with you and it may be that some of the things you're going to say now uh, will force us to change and if, when should one mention the Pfizer vaccine well this is interesting of course uh, there's nothing to stop a company saying uh, we are in the middle of phase three vaccine trials and we've broken the code and we found that actually our, our vaccine seems to have averted quite a lot of infections. We haven't put confidence intervals on it, but if we do it without the confidence in the intervals, it seemed to have a 90% uh, prevention rate. Uh, and this is after 94 participants in their trials got COVID. Um, well, they're supposed to continue until 164 cases have occurred. Uh, whilst it was okay to break the code, the, the design of the phase three trial was to say, you go through until 164 cases. Also, uh, the regulators will ask them not just to go through to 164 cases, but they'll, see, they'll say, go on looking at your study sample for at least two months, perhaps longer afterwards because under the rules of phase three vaccine trials, you spend longer to look for any adverse impacts that might imply lack of safety. Some of you may have heard that uh, another vaccine trial that's underway, phase three in um, Brazil has been halted because of a safety issue. So it's absolutely essential to go on. So you, one could ask oneself, why on earth did the company break the code and make all this fuss when actually under their phase three trial regime, they should go on for longer. And um, um, uh, a lot of people have written to me saying they wonder why it's gone on, but it's had an enormously positive impact. Lots of people jumping up and down, lots of media inches spent and uh, lots of people 
rushing to buy the vaccine and some other impacts on the company. Uh, my view is it's really important to wait until phase three trial process is finished. And then it's really important that the national regulator authorities review the data properly. I mean, the fact is that the current estimates for vaccine hesitancy around the world are in France around 40%. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what the precise figure is. And in the US, they're around 30%. And it would be a really bad, bad news thing if this was rushed into production and rushed into licensing on some kind of emergency use procedure. And then people were to say, well, they thought it'd been so rushed and they didn't like the fact that the safety studies had been perhaps not done using the full process. And then we got big refusals on the vaccine. So my line has been quite cautious. Uh, and that means that I feel in myself that I'm a bit of a, a killjoy. So I have been saying in public, this is very good news. And it's very good news that there are 10 other vaccine candidates going through phase three studies. But I've said the work's got to be finished. And there's one other thing. Do you know that this vaccine has to be stored at minus 60 degrees centigrade? And that means that it's super hard to deal with. We had an Ebola vaccine that had to be stored at minus 60. It was some headache. Catherine, who was involved in this, remembers how hard it was to get that a liquid nitrogen uh, out there and to keep the vaccine cold and to maintain the cold chain. We were so scared. And uh, uh, so, you know, we need to look and see whether or not it really is viable to use a messenger RNA vaccine developed using new process, if truly it's going to require this um, very, very cold temperature. Because how on earth is it going to be possible to immunize a lot of people in developing countries with a vaccine that requires that sort of situation? We therefore need to do more work on other vaccines as well as this one. Anyway, I am excited. It's great news. But I don't think, quite honestly, looking at the headlines in the UK press, that it means life goes back to normal at Christmas. No, no, no. I don't think so. I think this will be added to the palette of interventions and that next year it will be factored in. But we still have to go on with the things that we've been talking about uh, and make certain that they're put in place. Lastly, just a bit more on headlines and things. Why mink, you might ask? What is the big deal about mink? And should we worry about the spillover of the virus into a different communities? Well, I thought we'd spend a moment thinking about mink. Uh, the, the various species of animals that are uh, in this community of um, mammals that live on water's edge, like otters, like minks, and so on, uh, have been seen to be intermediate hosts in various forms of pathogenic illness. And it is just possible that mink is going to turn out to be an important intermediate host. The reason why the Denmark story is uh, causing so much uh, interest is as follows, that um, there is a, a, a feeling that the mutant form of the virus that has been found in Denmark is associated with the passage from human to mink and possibly back again, uh, that this mutant form of the virus has been found in communities close to mink farms in Denmark. Uh, and this therefore is a concern. I don't know whether or not the particular mutation that's associated with mink in Denmark is especially pathogenic compared with other forms of the virus, nor do I know whether it's going to have a different immunogenicity. Uh, clearly, it is of concern. And I noticed that a number of European countries have said that they are going to require people coming from Denmark to go into a longer quarantine. Israel, for example, has said that Denmark uh, people have to play, have special quarantine, and I think UK has as well. So we just have to keep an open mind. Uh, what happens in this kind of work is that you hear rumors 
and then gradually a bundle of evidence emerges and you start to say, ah, oh, well, this seems to be a reality. That's what happened with long tail COVID, uh, which is now very much in the, in, in the collective understanding of what a problem is. But as some of you will remember, uh, when we were starting to talk about long tail COVID, it was something that a few of us uh, had experienced. Ditto all the work that was, has been done to stress the need to wear masks. Uh, again, uh, it, it comes slowly. And I think this issue around mink and passage through uh, this particular group of mammals is going to be important to look at. So those were the things I wanted to talk about as of now. Looking ahead six months, I continue to be really disturbed about the situation in poor countries. I think the, uh, the really ferocious return of the virus into European countries that I've just described and the very, very difficult figures that we're looking at uh, around Europe. Uh, this honestly is going to uh, continue and will be uh, apparent in other parts of the world as well. And so I'm saying to everybody, um, you know, the next few months are going to be difficult and we will need to continue to find ways to support each other as we do through these calls to cope with them. And, and it will be appearing in different countries and we won't always know exactly where it's going to come uh, because of the nature of this virus and the way in which it's spread. It's often very local outbreaks that build up quite quickly and we have to continue to watch that. So these are my opening remarks. I'm now going to go back. Uh, I've been looking at uh, the figures uh, until just now, and I'm going to go back and look at the screen and see everybody. Uh, I'd like to start by inviting uh, Tweed to talk about the survey, Jack to tell us what he's seeing on his pictures, and then it'd be nice to invite, um, uh, I'd like to hear from Scott right at the beginning, I'd like Rebecca Cantor to be ready, Mauricio Calderon, and Ajita Singh. A lovely to have you. I'd like to, you to come in and welcome you, Ajita, a former colleague working in the office of the UN Secretary General. Uh, and uh, so, and and then the conversation can go. And if you want to get my attention just through waving, don't hesitate to do so. Uh, but it's nice if it comes in through the chat. Just seeing Kathy, you've written something. So Scott, please. Uh, but Hang on, Scott, sorry. Just go to Twee first and Jack. Twee first, then Jack, then Scott. Get yourself organized, David. Twee. Thank you, David. So I'm gonna share the results with you all right now. You'll see most people joining from Europe with quite a few people joining from North America and Latin America today, which is brilliant. A good spread across all of the different age ranges. And then lastly, uh, today and how we're feeling, mostly optimistic and hopeful, which is wonderful. And a few people there answering uh, more of the negative uh, with one person responding on the most negative emotion there on grief um, or powerlessness there. So apologies to the person who answered there. I know it is not Scott. Uh, good to hear that you're feeling replenished today. Um, and again, thank you all for sharing and please do keep sharing even after these briefings with one another on our LinkedIn chat. Um, so now over to Jack. Are you able to share your screen? Come in, Jack. There you are. Hi, guys. Yeah, so it's a bit of a bowl of spaghetti at the moment, but I will be tidying it up over the next half an hour. Um, but yeah, and just nice to hear, as always, the focus on the need for kind of putting people back into yeah into a conversation that is often uh, people sort of seem absent from it, so yeah. Jack, everybody, it's great to see that Jack's sharing his screen at this early stage. He's showing him his secret, which is actually to anticipate where things might go and create the structure before he's got the detail to put in. I didn't realize that you did all that. Does yeah, well, you're being very kind suggesting that there's some methods going on, uh, David, thank you. Yeah, you know, thanks sure. for having me, it's always, always great to be here. Oh, Jack, thank you very much indeed, it's lovely, lovely. Everybody, that's a little bit of trade secret there, thank you very much indeed. Scott, please, 
lovely to see you. Do, do one uh, half sentence of self-introduction, then in you go. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you, David. Um, so I'm Scott Knox. I'm based in Toronto, Canada. I am a Brit. Um, well, actually, do I say Brit or should I say Scottish for those who want to get really territorial? Um, but um, but yeah, uh, so I, I just wanted to say, um, you may notice that it looks like I've opened a small department store uh, yeah. of Christmas decorations behind me. And it all comes back to uh, those who were there last week when I was having a bit of a moment, I was having a bit of professional wobble, an emotional wobble to say, do you know what, I'm just a bit done. I don't have the energy or the mental capacity to keep things going. Uh, and then basically found boxes of what was, those who, who know British retail, uh, Woolworths, um, Woolworths exploded in our house. And um, I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, I listened a few weeks ago to a, an Islamic scholar who was talking about um, po Islamic poetry. And uh, I think the uh, poet is uh, Rumi. Oh, God, forgive me if I've got that wrong. But, but it's about the whole notion of replenishment. And, you know, the, the, this scholar talked about and the moment it just worked for me was this, this notion that we've all got you know, most of us have mobile phones. And when it gets down to single digit battery life, we get panicky and wonder, God, how am I gonna replenish the battery? But we actually don't do this for ourselves. Um, and, and, and actually we need to. And, and I think that this year has been tough. It will continue to be tough. And I, God knows how Twee and the team and David, you get through all this by constantly being asked your opinions and on show. So God bless you and all the work that you and the team do. But just for me, it was a case of, why am I waiting to December to put the tree up? I'm gonna do it now. You should see our entire house. It is covered in baubles and twinkling and God knows what. In fact, we did the outside of the house too. And the street is just going a bit like, what is wrong with you? Um, and, and, and and I'm just going to say, don't wait. What is the Madonna line? Um, Poor is the man whose pleasures depend on the permission of another. And, and it's a trite. I know I'm quoting trite Madonna lyrics, but I just wanted to say, everybody needs recharging everybody needs to re-energize anybody needs to get to a point where you just go oh do you know what i'm gonna have that bit of candy i'm just gonna have that bauble i'm gonna listen to that 12 inch single that came out in the 80s and i'm gonna dance like nobody's watching just do it just do it because you'll be better for it um and and, and i've certainly found that and and the other thing that really 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 inspired me I was getting to spend time last week with Vicky and Nazim. Nazim, we, we always start these sessions with Nazim's uh, music videos. Uh, and, and, and I got the chance to, to, to talk with Nazim and I felt very nervous. There's me trying to be, you know, I'm a president and CEO in the ad industry in Canada. And then I am thinking, oh my God, this is taking me back to my childhood and I really wanted to be a pop star. And, um, but I got to work with, with, with Vicky and Nazim about some new lyrics for a new way of, of, of articulating where we've got a bit of, uh, what should I what we call it now, a bit of, you know, a, we'd be sort of a bit done with COVID, which we keep hearing in lots of territories and a new way to articulate some energy and how we should behave. It was just great to work with somebody from a totally different experience and, 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 uh, and so on. So um, yeah, I'm back in it. Wow. I was gonna, you know, and, and, and back onto the fight and to do it. So don't wait to replenish, just go and do it, is what I'm saying. And if it means hanging baubles from your earlobes, who cares? Mm. Just do it. But David, thank you. And thank you to you and your team for the community this is creating. I, I love having the conversation. It's one of my highlights of my week. So I'm not gonna apologize for how I was last week. I think we all need to accept that we can go there. It's just then, you know, having that spirit of endeavour and community to pull us back out because this is the long haul and, and, and we need that from each other. So thank you very much. And thank you, everybody, who just as soon as I joined were asking how I was doing, how absolutely deliciously fantastic. People I don't really know bothering about how I am. How amazing is that? So thank you, everybody. We're all um, totally, I think, here for each other. Thank you, Scott. Beautiful. Rebecca, please. Yeah, I don't know how much to go into. I rejoined LinkedIn just for you all. I have been off LinkedIn for years. Um, so I put full definitions in LinkedIn. Um, Scott, first of all, awesome, all of it. And I agree with you. This is like the recharge of my week. 
it'd be, I'm in Santiago, Chile. I'm a food systems professor. Um, it'd be easy for me to say that after five straight months of really strict, I mean, really strict lockdown, I'm now out celebrating like it's Christmas every single day, but it's not that easy. It's still a slog. Um, and this group definitely challenged me to think about the dictionary. I honestly wasn't gonna think about it. I just wanted to suggest it to you all, but I fi it finally came to me that I had to apply my food systems thinking cap to this. David, you said, look ahead six months. Yeah. I disagree. Even if the pandemic goes away at some point, which is debatable, something new is gonna come in. Um, like I said in the LinkedIn and over email, pandemic, whether we like it or not, is the new normal. We can't forget about climate change. We can't forget about social disruptions. Now we have the mink. So what animal, What other animal is gonna come next? Um, Syndemic is the new normal. And so therefore I realized we are going down the wrong path, trying to get go down a path because a path means at some point the path ends or it's not a path. And the whole cliche with a path is that it's messy. No one's life path is a straight line and we can't afford to be messy and syndemic. We're not even dealing with one pandemic. We're dealing with syndemic. Um, and so then by applying food systems thinking, it just all, it makes sense to me. I can put the whole def full definitions in the chat, but I feel like you have your typical micro and macro levels. And so the micro being the together lifestyle that everyone is in this together because the majority doesn't have COVID, may never get COVID, um, but we have to play our part. Um, and it's easy to say you're sick, isolate, but for the majority who's not sick, what do you say? And that's where the together lifestyle comes in. To me, that's analogous to living a healthy lifestyle. A healthy lifestyle consists of many different things. We might not do all of them, but those that do more of them are gonna be healthier th than those that don't. And that's the same with the together lifestyle. Don't worry, I've chosen that wording really carefully that in the together lifestyle, so you have things such as wearing a mask, physical distancing, isolating when sick, taking care of old people, eating fruits and vegetables to up your immune system, and the list can go on, just like we talk about a healthy lifestyle. But then it's not all on us, similar to follow the same food systems thinking. We all have our obesogenic environment. The obesogenic environment continues <laughs> during this pandemic, but we also can think about the together environment, that there's many environmental factors that are gonna make it harder or easier to live a together lifestyle. So for me in Chile, we have a five points, five step-by-step -step plan, which lays out different things. And in all cases lays out that you should be wearing a mask, that you should be physical dis distancing. And in certain cases you can get fined and it's no joke. Um, other countries, like where I was born in the United States, have nothing of a national strategy. So obviously they're hindering the together environment, which in turn does not facilitate a together lifestyle. And right now, for example, the US is totally not together. And I just wanna remind you all that Joe Biden, if he takes office, that won't be till January 18th. I'm already estimating excess death till January 18th, and it didn't have to come to that. So that's another story. But then I couldn't figure out how the together environment and the together lifestyle kind of fit together. Yeah. And that's when David kept me up last night with his podcast interview, where he mentioned honeycomb growth. David, I don't know where you've been hiding out with the honeycomb growth for months, mm. but honeycomb gr growth for me really interconnected the together environment and the together lifestyle. We've been talking about spider web, but spider web is sticky. It's a trap and it's made by one spider. Honeycomb growth, we're all in it together. It's very organized, it's sweet. And most importantly, it's empathetic. And we all have to be empathetic with each other together around the world, or this won't work. Syndemic is global. I'll, 
I'll stop there. The full definitions are in the LinkedIn, but I can also put them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for managing to get all the different pieces in. Uh, and um, um, I'm glad that the honeycomb growth works for you. Um, I, I prefer it to web, but I just haven't found the right way to explain it. Um, Rebecca, that was lovely. Scott, that was just beautiful, both of you. And I've just been noticing some nice stuff coming in the chat. So this is all good. Now we come to some more factual questions. Um, I'm just going to um, read them, actually. Well, no, I'm not. I'm going to invite the different people to say them because it's kind of... So I've got to try to not lose my place. Yes, uh, Mauricio Calderon, followed by Ajita Singh. Mauricio, please. Uh, yes, thank you, David. Hello, everyone. Um, Scott, absolutely wonderful. Um, we are with you, and all of us are with uh, everyone else. <laughs> Luckily, we have each other to count on. Um, I just wanted to mention that as part of a scoping review that I have been participating in of the pandemic uh, considered as a system from a system dynamics perspective um, that we've been doing over the last couple of weeks, um, and we are not inventing anything because there's a couple of very interesting global groups that have been working on this for several months now, but anyway, um, Things like, for example, the issue with the mix. Mm. Um, we need to uh, ha have a an integra in integrative um, general framework where we can fit everything and put it together with the rest of things that will that have been happening and will continue to happen. And obviously, one way of doing that is precisely considering the pandemic as a global system, which it is. Um, and uh, if if we take that perspective, and I know that this probably uh, rhymes or echoes with the work that you do at 4SD, David, um, then we, we, for example, for the policy framework development and uh, for knowing which science uh, we don't have yet and we ought to have, identifying certain things in knowledge gaps that we have right now, it might be very important to, to pursue at least as one of the lines of effort this, okay, let's, and I echo Rebecca's mentioning of the endemic because it's exactly the same issue that we're talking about, right? It, it is, it is, there's not one thing which is a virus. No, 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 no. There's a virus that interacts with a whole number of things that are functioning as a global system. And uh, anyway, that, I, I wanted to mention that because um, for policy development, for example, uh, we have found so far that it really helps to identify, okay, why, why certain policies are giving the uh, no, less than satisfactory results that they're uh, producing. Thank you, David. Mauricio, uh, John um, refers to this as living systems thinking. And uh, um, it, in, if you wouldn't mind a little bit later, John, I'd love you to if you want to, to react to what Mauricio said and also anything else. And Catherine, don't hesitate to come in and William in if you want to, just get my attention. I'd like to go to Ajita who wants to bring up the issue of another systems effect, which is COVID and mental health, COVID and stigma. Ajita, please. Thank you. Um, nice to meet you all. I'm a doctoral student at Columbia in New York, uh, working on policy and health. Right now, I'm focusing on mental health. And uh, so I particularly work with Syrian refugees living in Jordan. And the research that was done in 2018 is already showing that there is a huge gap, like there is a barrier to mental health services in the country. And now we have a small seed funding to um, analyze what are the existing barriers now in COVID era. So my question stems from that, this vulnerable population that was already suffering and is suffering um, will have to go through another layer of uh, barrier to care and especially mental health uh, facilities uh, that's available in country. 
The other um, piece that I'd like to bring up is I'm from Nepal and I have a COVID patient at home. My father got contracted 10 days ago. And it was just fascinating to know that with this community spread, there's this feeling in the community that everyone should have it because if you have it and if others don't, uh, you're basically considered as untouchable in certain communities. So how do we address this um, feeling of being isolated and then not being accepted in the society even after you're cured? Wow. And now this feeling that everyone should have it is, it's, it's not comfortable to witness it. And I'm thinking about, David, you talked about communications piece. And we know that uh, developing countries, it's very difficult to have internet access, but at the same time, social media and YouTube videos are very popular. It has the um, capability to change the narrative. It has the power to influence people, even among um, not uh, highly educated people. That's what I'm talking about, our yeah. um, generation. So how do we message this um, stigma associated with the disease? Thank you. Well, thank you, Ajita. Very glad you've got some, some resources to look at the additional challenge of uh, accessing mental health services. Uh, there are some really unpleasant statistics about increases in uh, people taking their own lives in Japan, uh, increases in uh, reported instances of mental ill health in the UK, particularly among women, and um, or, or, a huge amount of frustration and domestic violence uh, linked to COVID, which can be ascribed to mental ill health all over the world. So um, I don't have any answers. One of the things we would like to do, Ajita, in one of these sessions, probably in two weeks or so, is to have a special one on mental health. And we will be sure to contact you to tell you when that's going to happen. Thank you for bringing up this question about stigma in uh, Nepal, which I didn't know anything about. And I think it's important to know more about that. Uh, and um, I'll follow up direct with you, if I may. And lastly, um, any thoughts you've got about ways to influence? We have been working on this with short videos. Uh, we also have people on this call who are very active in communications. And uh, if you want to invite people to get in touch with you on the communications part, please put a message in the in the chat. But it's very, very helpful what you've just said. And uh, um, uh, I will follow up with you. Thanks very much. To Kathy Matthews, would you like to say what you're going to say? Also, Kathy, just a half a sentence to introduce yourself. Oh, sure. Thank you very much, Dr. Navarro. And greetings from Canada, everybody. Hang in there. We're going to get through this. Um, I, very practical questions. Um, uh, the first one, David, uh, do you think we'll still be social distancing and wearing masks a year from now, given the vaccine hesitancy? And secondly, what, what do you think about the uh, Eli Lilly announcement of the antibody treatment in the US? Hmm. Just a very quick thing on that. It's my view that it will take somewhere in the region of two years to enable everybody in the world to be vaccinated once a safe and effective vaccine uh, has been confirmed. So I think that the same behaviors will be in place by in Christmas 2021. I think the uh, Eli Lilly antibody drug that's been licensed will become more widely available, but it's expensive. And I don't think that it's going to become a, a treatment that everybody can access. Uh, in fact, I'm very concerned about the fact that there's insufficient work being done on, uh, on uh, therapies. And I'm going to ask Catherine if she can uh, just take my mic just to say a word about this. Catherine, please. Sure. Uh, just to mention that the Eli Lilly product was trials in people with serious COVID were stopped because there was no evidence that it was actually helping. And so this new availability is for people with mild 
to medium cases of COVID. And again, part of why it's being emergency licensed is to figure out whether it is effective. So uh, we don't have enough data to draw any conclusions yet about how much impact this kind of therapy might have at this point. Thank you very much indeed. I'd just like to say um, um, one other thing that you wrote on the chat was, uh, do I think that there will be a requirement for students to be vaccinated for September 2021? I don't know if there's going to be a, a vaccine sort of um, or series of vaccines that are proven yet. That's still work to be done. But even if there is, I shall be very surprised if countries introduce mandatory vaccination. I may be wrong, but just my, my core view at the moment is a real anxiety among the public health community that vaccination will, uh, that if it was compulsory, that, uh, uh, that this would actually lead to reduced uptake. So I can't give you anything more than that, Cathy. That's just a hunch. Um, to N.K. Seti, I'd like you to, to lob in your point now, N.K. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Dr. David. I don't know what exactly would you like me to say. Uh, well, one, situation in Delhi is not as conducive as it is so in other parts of the country or in other metropolitan cities. That's one. And what I feel, the seven elements which you mentioned are very relevant for each and every place where the things are not going well to be looked into. Yeah. So I can just, as maybe I can think aloud, like involving people. Yes, it's important. But is it actually happening all over? I think it's not so. Communication. Mm. Are the messages consistent? Mm. At times, the official version is of great success, yeah. which is not the ground reality. Yeah. Community to be supported. Yes, partly it's happening, whereby people are being given oximeters and being told how best they can do self-isolation at home, but it's not so universally. Yeah. Experts. Well, at, at places, the people who are not experts are giving advice. Yeah. Integrated response teams, yes, they are there. But if an administrator is there in charge of it, instead of being a facilitator, if the administrator who is in charge of the integrated team is authoritarian, it won't help. Government resources, yes, these are very important that the national resources are distributed equitably. Yeah. and connecting and the systems work. What I've observed, as the cases rise, the systems go haywire. Well, I think what that, can... Yeah, that's what I wanted to say to you. You've sent me a couple of extracts from the Hindustan Times pointing out that the situation in Delhi, which had previously, when Henk was uh, in India, had got really been quite good earlier this year, uh, while uh, Bombay was facing troubles, Mumbai, now Delhi, uh, 7,745 infections on the 8th of November, and uh, ICU beds not available, and uh, generally a not a good situation in New Delhi. Uh, I can't explain it. Uh, my assumption is that there's just been an awful lot of movement around associated with the festivals that take place at this time of year. Uh, and that there are some super spreader events occurring, something that you said to me. Uh, and, and I think it's really difficult when you've got this much transmission of the virus occurring to deal with it whilst at the same time trying to let people enjoy their major festivals like Diwali. Uh, and so uh, one, I think, is probably forced to, to uh, hypothesize that there is just too much population movement at the moment in Delhi for the situation to be contained and that it will require a, a period of quite major movement restriction, which is not what anybody wants to hear, but that is my assumption in the present situation, NK. 
I mean, the reality in East Asia is they just stop this big amount of virus from building up. There is no East Asian country at the moment that's got 7,000 cases a day. Uh, and when you've got this large amount of transmission underway, uh, it, it is very difficult to get it under control without significant movement restrictions and compulsory isolation of people who've got the virus. I'm going to ask Hank if he wants to comment. I mean, you're, pretty, uh, you're probably a bit nervous about commenting on what's happening in India, but I don't know whether you're there, Hank, still. Yes, um, yeah. Do you want to comment on the Delhi situation? Because you must have been looking at it. Yes, yes, I, I have, and I've been also a bit in touch, but for sure, indeed, I find it very difficult. I do not have that information which I had uh, six months ago when I was still in Delhi. Um, enormous challenges, and I think there's also another challenge which, which I just would like to mention is the pollution. There's also the time of the pollution which uh, does not help when people have uh, symptoms, then, then for sure they're suffering also quite a bit. Uh, but what has happened, of course, what, what the, but I, I think my colleague N.K. Sethi, he, he will most likely, is the best person of information. India needs also to open up. And, and I think that that was the part, the challenge with and opening up and, and figures which are still high uh, is, of course, an enormous challenge. Mm. And if you don't mind, I would like, I'd like also to bring in also something new of new thinking. This week I have been involved in commenting on some uh, ideas within some institution and political uh, parties about the population test. And this was about what Slovakia has been doing as an alternative, as an alternative for a lockdown. Now, Slovakia is, of course, quite special, but still I would like just to mention it because I, but I think it's also important at this stage of the fight, yeah. we have new tools. And if there are new tools, we need to do some new thinking. These, these quick tests, and now for instance, there's also the breeding test is coming up. It's not yet verified, so we need to be a bit cautious. But, but these new tools will also give us new means again to deal with some of the challenges. And, and I think that that is something which I hope this group also will continue and, and, and for sure, uh, lovely also to see Scott with his Christmas tree and give me also some ideas to do soon too. Uh, but we need this. I, I think we need also to still believe that we're still learning and we still get new tools and we can do something uh, about it. I, I think this population test is a little bit technical and I won't uh, say too much at this stage. But it, it's, it's, it's something which I would like also to this group to say from, we are still learning, we are still getting some tools. The vaccine, of course, was the major thing that gave us all hope. The therapeutic part, perhaps some things are happening. But even with the diagnostic itself, if the diagnostic is quicker and better, then I think we can do also an awful lot. And it is something which I would like to bring forth. But it always remains, and thank you, even quoting on the public health part, Whatever you do from a lockdown or with a population test, you need then still to have a public health system that can actually then detect it early, whatever is happening, and also be able to respond. Thank you. Well, I just want to thank you, Hink, for bringing this up. Uh, I was just looking for a little bit more information about what's happened in Slovakia. It really is absolutely amazing that uh, the... the um, the response uh, was quite impressive. It, between the two rounds of tests, there was a 60% reduction in positives, and there was a very high degree of, of, of participation, uh, and you had to isolate if you didn't agree to be tested. The cost was much less than a lockdown. Same approach, Hank, is being used a lot in China at the moment, as you probably heard, and there is many people suggesting that this is a reasonable appro uh, approach to use, especially if you don't know how much asymptomatic transmission there is. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit with WHO colleagues about this because that I think it's about time that the organization had a bit of a line on this. We've had it in, done in Liverpool. We've had, as you say, in Slovakia. There's other European countries that are thinking of it. I heard that the Dutch are thinking of it as well. My friend Frankie Shabesma told me that it's happening. So um, let's do a little bit more to find out about it. Thank you very much, Hank, for raising that. Uh, I'd like to uh, now say that we're just about at the end. Uh, just Pablo Ruiz 
uh, Suenza, I probably mispronounced your name, Pablo. Uh, if you're still on and you can unmute, just say hello, Pablo. Okay, then I'd like to go to the, uh, the team in the following order. Um, my, my William N, if you want to say anything, could you say it now? Thank you for being with us, William. Yeah, very quickly. I, my worry, I think, is the confusion that um, recent developments um, is likely to cause. Uh, and actually, listening to this conversation of the last hour, thinking about some of the technical innovations and so on, there is a sense, it's a much cloudier picture. Mm. Um, it's good news, but it's going to be very difficult to encourage people to retain the basic disciplines associated with movement restrictions and so on, while that new, that new good news is working through the system and people are understanding its implications and everybody is understanding its implications from policymakers downwards. So I think this is a, actually a good time, but a very dangerous time, yeah. uh, because I think there's a real risk of losing control of the public health agenda. Yeah, thank you. Uh, very good point, um, indeed. Um, others in the team that want to come in um, before I go to John, just shout out if you do. Um, anybody else? Twee. Twee, would you like to come in? Thank you. Um, I see some comments in the chat around a, a special session dedicated to mental health. Uh, I think this is, I've seen this a few times now. So I'd like to invite anyone who would like to work with me on building that or what that might look like uh, to reach out to me. You can do that on the LinkedIn directly, which I put in earlier, or send me an email, thuy at 4sd.info. Um, I'll put that again in the chat, but please do reach out to me. Um, I'd love to hear your ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Twee. I found the reference to Slovakia. It's a writer's article. If anybody, uh, I'll try and just put it in the chat uh, uh, with a quote from the Prime Minister. Um, I, I think that might be helpful. Um, anybody else from the team want to come in? Or uh, Okay, John, you come next then, please. Thank you, John. Well, just... A, just a quick response, David, and you know that this is very hard to do in a short time because you sort of teed me up to say, well, it's, we call it living systems and, and, and what do we mean by that? Um, in a, yeah. Say again, David? I thought you'd like that one, John. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the, it's, the, it's the four minutes over time and, and trying to do it in, in minus four minutes that will be the, cha the challenge. But in essence, most of our thinking about how human organization works comes from industrialization. And in that stage, we were putting things into machines and taking it out. It made a huge leap forward in terms of productivity, but actually at the time it was a negative step initially in terms of health. But what it created was a very linear way of thinking. If you do X, Y will happen. You can plan from end to end. If you haven't got it right, it's because you haven't planned right or hired the right experts. We think the world's not like that. We think the world is alive. We think human organizations are, are part of an ecosystem and work in ecosystems. And we know a lot about how ecosystems work, their symbiosis with their environment, environment. Um, they're complex, they're non-linear, small little things can have immense impact, as we've seen with COVID, or might not at all. Most, th most um, things that cross the zoonotic boundary die out very, very quickly for one or another reason. Um, they're inherently networked. So all these things are in our thinking when we start to try and shape the responses we make, the messages we give. And if people want to know more about that, on the 4SD website, there's some pieces on living systems leadership that David and I have written, and you can have a little look. John, you are amazingly beautiful with the way you use words, and you're so modest. Thank you for that, and I'm sorry I did the bad by not leaving you much time. Oops. Um, well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, we, we are dealing with with systems and they are alive and they don't, they're not linear as John said. And Rebecca's just reminded us that we have to learn to live with this syndemic, with honeycombs. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, uh, Jack, it's your la last moment. Here he is. He's put, oh, the honeycombs are there. Brilliant, Jack, off you go.
Any remark you want to make? Okay, you're on mute. Sorry, I uh, <clears throat> forgot how to unmute myself again. Um, I don't think I've got anything uh, serious to say except um, with remarks about um, the sort of mental health toll. It was really nice to hear, I think it was Scott talking about some uh, making an effort to look after yourself in the in the midst of all of this. So uh, yeah, that's uh, that's probably the only thing I have to say. But yeah, as always, thanks thanks for having us along. I'm so glad Scott's there. Beautiful with his decorations. How oh, beautiful! Okay, everybody, thank you very much indeed to Kirst, uh, to Polly. If you're there, let's just see lovely Isaac if he's around. And uh, I'm glad that. Um, Rebecca's suggesting we take the illustrations and put them in a copy book. Let's see what happens. Okay, there's uh, Otto. Otto, nice to see you, Otto. Uh, 